Are you working on a next generation chipset design? Have you considered how you're going to scale your power delivery? Oh sure, there are a couple ways to go about it, but only one way is easy to implement and saves money. Oh yes, let me introduce you to phase paralleling. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today's AI and networking applications are driving an exponential increase in compute power. When it comes to scaling power for these kinds of applications with next generation chipsets, we need to keep in mind package size constraints, dynamic current balancing, and output capacitance. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Mark Rodriguez from Infineon joins me to discuss the system design challenges with increasing power density for next generation chipsets, the benefits that phase paralleling bring to the table, and why Infineon's best in class transient performance with XDP architecture and transinductor voltage regulator can help you with your next high performance ASIC. SOC or XPU design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me, Amelia. Absolutely. Okay, we're talking about scalable power delivery for high performance ASICs, SOCs, and XPUs today. But, Mark, before we get started, can you set the stage for us? What is driving this need for increased compute power these days? Absolutely. So, Infineon brought to the market the first ever high phase count digital PWM multi phase controller, and that's capable of switching up to 16 phases. This was developed to support high-performance ASICs, SOCs, and XPUs. And at the time of release, this was the first true 1,000 amp voltage regulator solution. As time progresses, the power requirement for these applications are increasing beyond this level, and designers are needing to find alternative methods to support this. This is where scalable power delivery comes into play. Power consumption in ASIC applications has increased exponentially over the last 10 years, and there's no signs of slowing down. Networking, artificial intelligence, and deep learning have been a main force in driving power levels higher. These applications, they have to handle heavy workloads, process them at an extremely fast throughput. To meet this demand, DC and AC current levels are increasing to levels over 1,000 amps, with the trend pushing to 2,000 amps in the future. This is requiring higher per phase current capability, which poses a challenge to the person designing the DC to DC voltage regulators powering these chips. And when it comes to the dynamic load currents, high performance ASICs can demand steep AC current load steps. And its internal logic is sensitive and requires that the output voltage remains tightly regulated. To achieve this task requires best-in-class transient response. This is what Infineon's nonlinear control engine combined with TLVR offers. Okay, so Mark, when it comes to delivering these next-generation chipsets, there are different ways to go about this, right? Uh, correct, yes. Yeah. So there's the phase doubling approach. And this is realized by using an additional PWM doubler IC, which is basically a multiplexing circuit. The doubler provides two PWM output signals, PWM1 and PWM2, which is used to drive a power stage. And these are controlled by a single PWM input from the PWM controller. Now, PWM1, PWM2, they alternate at half of the PWM input frequency. And with the phase doubler circuit, there is uh, added delay from the controller PWM rising and falling edge to the phase driver rising and falling edge to the switching node. These delays will cause a current imbalance during steady state and transient load conditions. And for these reasons, you know, along with increased cost of needing additional ICs and increasing the PCB area, this is not a preferred method to increase the per phase current. Some may ask, hey, why don't we design higher phase count controllers? Well, a thousand plus amp design will require over 20 phases. Currently, there isn't a native controller on the market that supports this. This is mainly due to complexity in controller architecture, 
constraints in device packaging and diminishing returns on performance versus cost. The solution is to implement phase paralleling. It's a very simple and easy to design in, and it's completely scalable to 16, 24, 32 phases with today's 8, 12, 16 phase PWM controllers. When combined with you know, Infineon's XTP controllers and power stage, good steady state and dynamic current balance can be achieved. Now, let me elaborate just a little more on what I mean by performance versus cost when deciding on a higher phase count controllers. One of the most beneficial features of a multi-phase VR is phase interleaving to reduce the ripple current amplitude. And you can see from this graph here that shows the normalized output ripple current on the y-axis versus the duty cycle on the x-axis for an eight phase up to 32 phase VR. What it shows is that after 16 phases, the reduction in ripple is insignificant. So if we can achieve similar performance, keep costs lower, reduce the PCB footprint and signal routing, there's no benefit to design a control to do more than 16 phases, especially with phase paralleling. So this kind of phase paralleling does increase output current capacity, right, Mark? Can you talk about that a bit more? Yes, so it does. A 16-phase controller can be scaled to 32 phases, so effectively 2xing your per-phase current capability. Now, with phase paralleling, there's no need for a phase doubler IC. Okay, this reduces the cost and size of the solution. The same PWM from the controller is shared by two phases, which avoids the current imbalance issue that you experience with the phase doubler. Now, current sharing in this case relies on MOSFET already on, inductor DCR and PCB resistance, and also on tight MOSFET driver distribution, which Infineon optimizes in design. Okay, so Mark, accuracy is also really important here as well. What does the current sharing accuracy look like in this case? Yeah, good question. So here I have a zoomed in view of all the parasitic parameters that impact the current sharing accuracy of two parallel phases. So it consists of the MOSFET RDS on, of both the high side and low side, the PCB copper resistance, which is the resistance between two phases that share the same PWM, inductor DCR, and the driver package drain and source parasitic. So taking into account contributions from all parameters and conducting a Monte Carlo simulation using 1,000 runs to analyze the current imbalance between the two phases, we can see that the maximum error between the two phases is within 4.98 amp. When you consider the maximum current from one phase and the minimum current from the other phase. So how does each perimeter contribute to the overall worst case imbalance? Yes. Overall worst case simulation shows that the mean current imbalance is 0.03 amp and that the max imbalance is 4.98 amp. We can see that the most critical parameter contributing to the current mismatch is the driver delay difference. RDS on of the MOSFET is the next most important parameter. And since the low side MOSFET conducts much more longer than the high side MOSFET, the contribution to the current imbalance from the low side MOSFET RDS on, it's more than that than from the high side MOSFET RDS on. Third most important parameter is the PCB resistance. And then lastly is the inductor DCR, which is just usually selected with a trade-off between current balance and converter efficiency. Okay, cool. Now, Mark, is there anything we can do to get the best current balancing possible? Yes. Uh, so using MOSFETs with a higher RDS on, inductors with a higher DCR, they help current imbalance between the two parallel phases, but will lower efficiency. So a trade-off has to be made for your MOSFET RDS on and inductor DCR. Using power stages that are optimized to reduce the time delay difference between the PWM rising edge and falling edge, just like Infineon's smart power stages. And you can also implement very simple layout tricks to maximize the PCB resistance between two parallel phases. And this is what I'm showing here. So you can see in the left side diagram, we don't have them side by side, right? We put some separation between the two. And this helps to increase that RPCB resistance, which will be helpful to improve the current balance. 
And the greater the separation, the greater the resistance, the better it is to improve the current balance. So you can see on the right side diagram, we've increased the separation even more. So this will all depend on what you have available for your layout, what kind of space you have and routing options. But simple techniques like this are very useful. Just another example here, same concept, but this is for a four-sided power delivery approach, which is very common in ASIC applications here. And same thing, we separate the two phases here with the right side having the greatest separation and it will result in the best current balance between the two. Okay, so Mark, do you have an example of this in a real life design that you can show me? Yes, so we've developed multiple demonstration boards. I have one shown here. This is using Infineon's 16 phase XDP controller and smart power stages in a phase parallel configuration. So meaning that it's capable of supporting 32 phases. So it's a dual side power delivery. We have 16 phases on the top, 16 phases on the bottom. We ran some tests with 12 volt V in, 0 0.8 volt V out, 700 kilohertz switching frequency, and 1200 amps of apple current, which is very typical specs for an ASIC application. Okay, so what about during load transient and steady state conditions? What does that look like? Yeah, so we monitored the phase currents of two sets of parallel phases during steady state and dynamic loading. We then measured the delta of the peak and valley between the two phase currents to quantify the phase current imbalance. During steady state, the phase current imbalance was less than one amp. And during a low transient event, which presents the worst case for phase current balancing, the maximum delta between the two phases is within three amps. I mean, which clearly shows that, um, you know, Infineon's XDP control architecture with phase paralleling provides superior current balance and that it's an excellent solution in uh, scaling your design to uh, higher current levels. So Mark, we're also talking about this TLVR solution as well. So what specific design challenges is this solution looking to help solve? Yeah, so uh, TLVR helps to solve the challenges with transient response. So fast transient response requires high bandwidth and a small inductance value, right, to minimize the output voltage undershoot and overshoot during a transient event. Now, conventional design standards tend to limit the bandwidth to one-fifth to one-tenth of the switching frequency. So for a design switching at 800 kilohertz, the bandwidth of the control loop would be in the 80 to 100 kilohertz range. I can tell you from experience that even in the upper range, it's extremely challenging to meet the tight tolerance requirements that ASIC applications require. We typically have to sacrifice efficiency by using small inductance values, you know, to have faster inductive current slew rates, and we have to rely on expensive bulk capacitors to support transient. TLVR, along with innovation in magnetics, combined with Infineon's XDP nonlinear control engine, breaks the norm. And it allows for high bandwidth, fast transient designs, you know, that maintain high efficiency without the need for bulk capacitors. So Mark, can we take a closer look at the TLVR? Yeah, so TLVR, it stands for Trans Inductor Voltage Regulator, which is a new topology. It's similar to coupled inductor, but without IP restrictions. It's a simple concept based on magnetic coupling, and it provides a significant reduction in equivalent inductance. This is the key benefit that substantially improves transient response and actually allows for a reduction in output capacitance. Now, to convert the conventional buck regulator to a TLVR buck regulator, the output inductor at each phase is replaced with a transformer whose secondary winding, we call LM, or magnetizing inductance, connects the switching node to Vout, and whose primary winding is connected in series with all the phases. And this gets terminated with a compensation inductor we call LC to ground. Now, the magnetizing inductance carries a DC bias current as well as a triangular ripple current at the switcher frequency. And this is what you would see in your conventional buck regulator if you were to look at the inductor current. Whereas the compensation inductor, this is going to carry a ripple current with a frequency of n times the switching frequency, where n is the number of phases. 
Now, this current flows through the series primary windings and is reflected back to the secondary windings of all the phases. So now each phase current is a superposition of the compensation winding currents and the magnetizing winding currents. So now, in the event of a transient load step, the duty cycle of the PDM waveform is going to increase, causing the magnetizing currents in that phase to increase. This increase in magnetizing current will also cause an increase in the current in the compensation inductor. Now, since each phase current is a superposition of the compensation inductor current and the magnetizing winding current, all phases see an increase in current and will respond to the demand of the load step. This results in a substantially lower effective output inductance, higher bandwidth, and an extremely fast transient response with most of the transient current being supported by the current in the compensation winding. You can see on the left-hand side here, this is a very interesting plot that compares the phase current for the uncoupled transient step to that of the TLVR transient step, and the delta in phase current is significant. So now, the same characteristics that apply to a load step also apply during a load release. So when the load current decreases, the current in the compensation inductor will also decrease, and through coupling, all the phases will experience a downslope in currents. This effectively reduces the excess energy in the output inductors at a much faster rate. The result is an overall reduction in, in peak output voltage overshoot. So, Mark, what about the equivalent inductance? What does that look like with the TLVR? Yes, so this is the fundamental property of the TLVR that's responsible for such good transient response. The equivalent you know, TLVR inductance is only a fraction of the uncoupled multiphase inductance. From this equation, you can see that the equivalent output inductance depends on the magnetizing inductance, the compensation inductance, the coupling coefficient, and the number of phases. Now, if the LC is very small, the transient response is going to be very good, but at the expense of having higher ripple currents in the coupling loop. Whereas if the LC value is set too high, the ripple currents will be lower, but you lose the coupling effect, and you know, as a result, we'll have slower response during a transient. So in Finion, we've developed a design calculator to assist in the evaluation of these critical parameters when you're designing in your TLVR solution. Let's look at the impact the compensation inductor has on bandwidth. So the graph in the upper right here, uh, this plots the ratio of the compensation inductor over the magnetizing inductance, which represents the x-axis, and then the ratio of the TLVR bandwidth over the conventional buck bandwidth, which represents the y-axis. You can see that when the compensation inductor and the magnetizing inductance are equal, the bandwidth increases by a factor of three. So in the bottom right here, the body plot was measured on bench in an eight-phase design. So here, we were able to achieve a very fast bandwidth of 332 kilohertz while maintaining a low switching frequency. This is going to provide a very good transient response with less output capacitance and without the need to push the switching frequency higher, thus maintaining high efficiency. That makes sense. Now, Compared with a standard inductor, how does the TLVR deliver when it comes to total capacitance? TLVR delivers the same or better transient response over a standard inductor design, but with less output capacitance. So as an example, uh, here is an apples to apples comparison of a standard buck versus a TLVR buck for an Intel VR14 design. The TLVR solution meet spec with 50% less output capacitance. Real world example here, this is a board we developed for ASIC specific applications. We did a same type of apples to apples comparison. This time it was for a 32 phase design. So we were using a 16 phase controller in a phase parallel mode. Switching frequency was 500 kilohertz. And with the TLVR solution, we were able to reduce output capacitance by 70% and achieve better transient when compared to the standard inductor. So here is bench data. Uh, the left-hand side here is your standard inductor buck, and then on the right-hand side is your TLVR buck regulator. Both designs 
underwent a 600 amp load step at 1500 amps per microsecond. And visually you can see the difference in transfer response, but overall the TLVR solution at 70% less output capacitance had a 42 millivolt reduction in output undershoot and overshoot. Okay, so Mark, what's the efficiency story here? So with TLVR, the current ripple in the coupling loop does give an additional loss, and it should be considered when thinking about efficiency. We can minimize the loss with the ratio of the compensation inductor over the magnetizing inductance. And when this ratio is 0.5 or higher, the efficiency can be maintained at, at a high level even with a rather high switch in frequency. So here, this is a highly dynamic TLVR setup with Infineon's best-in-class power stages, and it's compared to a conventional solution. You can see that the two plots here are nearly identical, and both have very good high peak and heavy load efficiency. This is going to result in a solution that uses less energy and has better thermals. Excellent. Well, Mark, this was a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Sure. So XPU, ASICs, and SOC currents continue to increase exponentially to deliver improved system performance and reduce latency. You can design practical and scalable solutions with XDP controllers for higher power, 1,000 amps or more systems uh, by paralleling phases of a multi-phase VR. Finion's XTP control engine combined with TLVR inductors offers best-in-class transient response, superior steady state and dynamic current sharing, smallest output capacitance bank, highest quality and reliability, best-in-class total cost of. Infineon controllers are highly flexible with the ability to implement custom features through firmware upgrades without respinning the silicon. This greatly improves time to market. We also have TLVR-specific features embedded into our controller, such as accurate current synthesis, which is important for features such as auto-phase add, auto-phase drop. We also have TLVR inductor open and short fault detection, and this helps manufacturers bring defect-free products to the market. Excellent. Well, Mark, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal.